Our parsha is the culmination of a few months now of Torah readings. You know, we started reading about the tabernacle, the Mishkan, Parsha's Teruma, Teruma, Tetzav, Kisisa, Vayakra, Patude, Vayikra, Tzav, and now it's Shemini, and we're finally at the inauguration ceremony of the tabernacle. This day, the Yom HaShemini, the eighth day, is the first day of Nisan. It's a little bit shy of a year since the nation has left Egypt. And of course, we've seen this day already before, the end of Parsha's Piku day, at the very end of the book of Exodus, we had a little window into the events of this day. But this is a very important day in the Jewish calendar. This is when Moshe is handing over the reins to Aaron and his sons, and they are permanently going to be the Kohan and the priests going forward. For seven days, Moshe served as the interim Kohen Gadol, the interim high priest. He wore the garments and he did the sacrifices. And our parsha is the Yom HaShemini, it's the eighth day. And now the handover from Moshe to his older brother Aaron, it's going to commence. And our parsha begins with the sacrifices that Aaron did to clinch his transformation into becoming a Kohen and the patriarch of the family of Kohanim. So, of course, the day has some major highlights after all the sacrifices. A fire descends from heaven and it consumes the sacrifices and everyone's delighted and everyone is terrified. There's trepidation and joy mixed into one. They receive blessings. What an amazing day. All this hard work has paid off. God is in our midst. And we have Aaron as the high priest going to intermediate on our behalf, going to pray for us going to offer our sacrifices, this is what we signed up for. But of course, the day also has a stunning downer, the untimely death of Aaron's two sons, who brought an unauthorized sacrifice and were burned. So this is an important milestone of the Torah. Aaron is being elevated, he is being promoted to being the Kohen, to being the people's representative before the Lord. He's going to be the emissary of the nation. He's going to be the intermediary of the nation. He is now the spiritual leader of the people. Moshe is like the king, but Aaron is the priest. Now, when we examine the coronation, so to speak, of Aaron, we discover something really interesting. We discover that it almost didn't really happen. And when we probe deeper we learn some really interesting ideas about the ideal makeup of leaders. Turns out that the Torah evaluates leaders by a completely different standard than what we are accustomed to. Let's look at the evidence. In the seventh verse of our Parsha, we read how Moshe is instructing Aaron to go offer the sacrifices of this inauguration day. Vayomer Moshe el Aaron. Moshe said to Aaron, come close to the altar and process your sin offering and your elevation offering and provide atonement for you and for the nation, process the sacrifices and give them atonement. Rashi notes that Moshe had to encourage Aaron. He told him, Krav el Hamizbech, come close to the altar. Why did Moshe have to encourage him, come close? Rashi tells us, really interesting, because Aaron was resistant. He was hesitant. Says Rashi, Shahaya Aaron Bosch. Aaron was ashamed. He was diffident. He was scared to approach. Amrlo Moshe, Lamata Bosch. Why are you being bashful? Lekach Nivharta. For this, you were chosen. Aaron was not overly eager to accept this responsibility of being the Kohen. He had to do the sacrifice But Moshe had to encourage him. He was scared. He was embarrassed. He was bashful. He was fearful. And Moshe says, no, this is what you're chosen for. Moshe nudged him. Moshe encouraged him. And indeed, he went forth. Aaron was bashful. He felt unworthy for this role. Maybe he thought that Moshe was a more suitable candidate. You know, Moshe for seven days was the interim Kohen Gadol, the interim high priest. Maybe Aaron felt that Moshe was a worthier candidate and maybe Moshe should be the permanent Kohen. 
But Moshe had to encourage him. No, don't be bashful. For this you were chosen. And when Aaron heard Moshe's words of encouragement, he gave in, he capitulated, he accepted his new role, and he approached the altar to do the service. Now, why indeed was Aaron hesitant to assume the role of the Kohen Gadol, of the high priest? So Rashi doesn't tell us. Rashi doesn't tell us why Aaron was bashful and diffident and scared to approach. The Midrash gives us the whole story. We know the altar, of course, is the flat platform on top, but in the four corners of the flat platform are what's called the horns of the altar, are like these, these elevated squares that go up on all four corners. So the Midrash tells us that when Aaron looked at the altar, where he had to go. He had to go to do these sacrifices. He saw the altar. The horns of the altar reminded him of the horns of the golden calf. A few weeks ago, we had this awful episode of the golden calf that seemed, or at least the way you read it simply, it seems that Aaron played a vital role in actually making the golden calf, which is almost tantamount to idolatry. And the golden calf, bovines, they have horns. So Aaron looks at the altar, and the altar has horns. And he looks at it, he's like, wait, that reminds me of the golden calf that had horns. And he remembered his role in facilitating the egregious sin of our people, the most egregious sin of our people, the golden calf. And he says, I'm not worthy. How can someone who played such a vital role in the sin of the golden calf, how can that person be the spiritual leader of the people. It can't be. Someone else, Aaron reasoned, should become the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Not him. I can't do it. I'm blemished. I'm flawed. I'm tarnished. I'm not going to do it. He was scared. He was bashful. And Moshe said, no. For this, you were chosen. Don't be bashful. Now, what is the reasoning behind Moshe's response? How indeed did Moshe rebut Aaron's argument that he was unworthy of this position due to his role in making the golden calf? So simply put, you know, Aaron says, I'm not worthy. Look at these horns. Don't you remember the golden calf? I had a critical role. I kind of made the golden calf. How could I be the representative of the Jewish people? I'm flawed. And Moshe responded. This is the simple way of reading what Moshe responded. Moshe told Aaron, well, your arguments are moot because God chose you to become the Kohen Gadol, chose you to become the high priest, and this is the role that you were chosen for. For this, for this role, you were chosen despite your misgivings. That's the simple interpretation of this dialogue between Moshe and Aaron. But the commentaries offer a bunch of novel readings that reveal something much deeper. I did see a whole bevy of interpretations of this dialogue between Moshe and Aaron. I'm going to share three of them because they have a common thread that I think will radically reshape how we view leadership and how we view the qualifications of becoming a leader. So again, Aaron has to do these sacrifices. He doesn't want to do it because he's reminded via the horns of the altar. He's reminded of the horns of the golden calf. And Moshe nudges him, do it, approach the altar, for this you were chosen. The commentaries read Moshe's response with some subtlety, and some nuance. When Moshe responded, for this you were chosen, it's not simply for this mission you were chosen, but instead they read Moshe's response, for this specifically for the reason why you think you're disqualified, specifically due to your role in making the golden calf, for this you were chosen. That is why you were chosen. In a weird way, Aaron's experience with the golden calf actually, and then counterintuitively, qualified him to become the person to represent the Jewish people. You weren't chosen despite your role in the golden calf. But for this, you were chosen. The reason why you think you're disqualified, that is precisely the reason why you were chosen for this role. Specifically because of what happened with the golden calf and its aftermath, that is why you were chosen. 
And these three interpretations have, have slightly different ways of, of saying, of saying similar ideas. And let's go through them one by one by one and see what we discover. Aaron made a big blunder with the episode of the Golden Calf. Of course, he had his reasons. The Talmud says that he knew they would have killed him. And if they would have killed him, it would have been an unforgivable crime because Aaron was both a priest and a prophet. And if you kill a priest and a prophet, that is a unforgivable crime. And therefore, Aaron tried to delay, but he eventually played ball with them. But ultimately, bottom line, Aaron participated in this terrible sin of idolatry. And yes, you may have had your reasons and justifications, but ultimately, Aaron did something that was somewhat sketchy. But Aaron repented. And there's an amazing teaching in the Talmud. This is such an incredible teaching. It should be framed. Someone should make a piece of art with this teaching and send a copy of this art to every Jewish family in the world because it's such a critical and amazing idea. The Talmud tells us in the book of Brachos, I'm going to tell you where you, where you find this Talmud because you won't believe me. You'll say, no, no way. Rabbi Wolf is trying to pull a fast one on us. He's making this one up. It's not true. I'll give you the source. I'll give you the citation. In the Talmud, in the Book of Brachos, on page 34b. Amar Rabavo, Rabavo says, B'makam shebali tshuva omdim, in a place, in a stature, where the bali tshuva, where the people did tshuva, the people who repented, where the penitents stand, tzadikim gemurim enam omdim. Those who are tzadikim gemurim, completely righteous people, they cannot stand. There's a stature achieved by someone who blundered and then fixed it. That stature, that lofty level is unmatched by even the completely righteous people who never sinned, who never blundered to begin with. An amazing idea. Talmud, Brachos, 34b. Someone who is pristine. They're flawless. Tzadikim gemurim. They never sinned. They never distanced themselves from the Almighty. Completely righteous. Someone like that, well, you would imagine they have an undoubtedly lofty and elevated and high stature and they're close to God. But who is even higher? Who is loftier? Says the Talmud. The Baal Tshuva, the penitent, someone who was far from God but came closer. The level that that person achieves, even the pristinely righteous cannot stand at that level. Even the pristinely righteous cannot achieve the high level of the penitent. Now, if you look at the Talmud, in the aforementioned Talmud, Brachos 34b, and you look at the commentators, many of them view this teaching with incredulity. How can it be that someone who, who blundered and then fixed, a penitent, is on a higher level than someone who never sinned. So some of the commentators say, well, you, you can't understand this Talmud the way it's it's implied simply. And they seek to offer alternative explanations of this Talmud. But again, we read the Talmud clearly. B'makrom, Shabali Tshuva Omdim, in a place, in a level, in a stature, where the, Bali Tshuva, where the people who do Tshuva, the people who repent, the penitents, where they stand, even someone who's completely, unadulteratedly, pristinely righteous cannot stand, cannot achieve that level. And by the way, it's not just us who say this. A personality no less than the Rambam, Maimonides, when he talks about repentance, he invokes this Talmud. This is featured in the Laws of Repentance, Chapter 7, Law number four, a balchuva, a person should not imagine that a balchuva, that a penitent is distant from the level, from the stature of the righteous because of the sins and the transgressions that they did. Ain hadavar kein, the matter is not so. Ela ahuv, they are beloved, v'nechmat, and cherished. L'fnei haborek ti'ilu lo chatam olam. They are cherished by God as if they never sinned in their lives. 
Velo owed, and not only that, moreover, Shescharu Harbei, their merit is great, is vast. Because after all, they tasted the taste of sin, and they departed from it, and they overcame their temptations. And then he quotes our Talmud. Amru Chachamim, our sages said, Makam Shvalachuva owned him in a place where the Valachuva, where the penitents stand, Ain Tzadikim Gemur Michol Namabo. Even the Tzadikim Gemur, the completely pristinely righteous people, cannot stand there. Kolomar, as if to say, so the Rambam is going to explain this Talmud for us. Ma'alasan, their stature, Gedola is greater, Mima'alas Elish Lochatim Olam, than the stature of those who never sinned in their lives. So he says it clearly that the stature of a penitent is higher than the stature of someone who never sinned. And he adds a reason. The reason why they are higher is because it's harder to do. Someone who ignored, who neglected what Hashem wants of them, someone who violated the will of Hashem, violated the will of their Creator, they grew distant, sadly, from their Father in Heaven. For them, it's really hard to restore that relationship, to mend that relationship. It's harder for them than for someone who has never grown distant to just maintain their standing. Someone who wants to become a Balchuva, someone who wants to become a penitent, they have to overcome their Yetzirah, their inclination, more than a completely righteous person has to just maintain their standing. And therefore, because it's harder to be a Balchuva, it's harder to be a penitent than it is to be someone who is pristinely righteous, their level is higher. What an amazing thing. Someone who was not standing up to their part of the deal with God, someone who made blunders in their life and in their relationship with the Almighty, they have an opportunity to catapult to a level higher than someone who is a complete tzaddik. You know, people feel disadvantaged when and if they were raised without a strong background in Jewish learning and observance. Oh, you guys, you have it so easy. You were raised with it. Your whole life you kept Shabbos and kosher and you wore tefillin every day since your bar mitzvah. You were indoctrinated from day one. We have it so hard. We didn't grow up with all this. We have to create this kind of life on our own. To a certain extent, that idea or that sentiment resonates. But the truth is that someone who was raised without an intimate and direct relationship with the Almighty, they have an opportunity to become a Baal tshuva. They have an opportunity to, for, to become someone who restores the relationship with the Almighty. And the result of that is that they can achieve a higher level Again, this is the Talmud, Brachos 34b, confirmed by the Rambam. This is what the Talmud is telling us. They can achieve a higher level than someone who never had lapses in their relationship with the Almighty. Let's get back to Aaron. Aaron, he felt unworthy to be the coin. Given his role, his participation in the making of the golden calf, he felt that the distance that that event caused between him and God disbarred him from being the Kohen who enters the inner sanctums. He was shamed. He was fearful. He was bashful. He was diffident. Shame, by the way, shame of your previous behavior is a mark of repentance. Shame is purifying. The Talmud tells us the book of Brachos again. This time is not, it's not uh, 34b, it's 12b. If someone does a sin and they are ashamed of that, they are forgiven for all their sins. So Aaron did a sin, but he was shameful of, or he was ashamed of it. He was bashful. And Moshe tells him, that's why you were chosen. Absent the episode of the golden calf, and the subsequent repentance. Suppose Aaron would have been completely righteous, with no hitches, no bumps in the road, no sins. He would have been completely righteous. And of course, he would have had a very high level. But it wouldn't be high enough to become the Kohen Gadol. 
you wouldn't have achieved the high level required to become the high priest absent your fall from grace, so to speak, and the subsequent repentance, which made you like a Valchuva, which made you like a penitent, and you achieved a higher level than you would have achieved had you not sinned. Remember, the level of the penitence exceeds the level of someone who never sinned to begin with. Aaron, this is why you were chosen. You are a penitent. You're someone who, you did the golden calf. And again, of course, it's a very complicated question. Where is Aaron's culpability? But at a certain level, he was culpable. He was liable. And he was shamed of it, or he was ashamed of it. He was bashful, which is a mark of repentance. So we know he repented. He's about tshuva in this area. He's a penitent in this area. Says Moshe, this is why you were chosen. You were chosen. You became qualified to be the high priest specifically because of your shame for this transgression, for your repentance on this transgression. Now you are qualified. So this, again, reads a much deeper understanding in the dialogue. Aaron says, well, I'm not qualified. I did this in the golden calf. And Moshe responds, no, for this, this, this is why you were chosen, specifically because you did the golden calf. And you repented subsequently. That is why you were chosen. That is what qualified you to have that very high level, the higher level than even the completely pristinely righteous people. Now you are about tshuva, and now you, in fact, are qualified to be the high priest. The second explanation that I want to share along these lines, and that is that part of the general requirement of being a leader is to have some skeletons in the closet. The Talmud tells us, the book of Yoma, page 22b, we don't appoint a leader upon the nation unless they have a box of rodents tied to their neck. What that means is, this is the ancient way of saying, skeletons in the closet, rodents on your neck. You have to have some background, some history to become a good leader. Someone who lives a completely error-free, pristine life, someone like that, can't really relate to the common folk, can't really understand the struggles of normal, mortal humans. Moreover, the ordinary folk, common folk, can't relate to someone like that. This person's like an angel. They have nothing to do with me. I'm a simple person. I got to deal with all these problems. I have all these flaws. I have all these shortcomings. I have all this trauma, all this baggage. This person, complete from day one, nothing wrong with them. A total sterling pedigree, sterling history, success from day one. I can't relate to that person. Someone who is pristine doesn't have any skeletons in the closet, won't make a great leader. Moreover, someone like that is liable to maybe be a bit aloof. After all, you know, you were born with the silver spoon in your mouth and everything worked out well and there were no rough patches in your backstory. Someone like that, you may be a bit uh, hubristic. You may feel like you're on top of the world because after all, you are. Everyone else, they're blundering and you are mistake free. Someone like that cannot be a great leader. Again, the Talmud tells us, Talmud tells us, you only appoint someone who has skeletons in the closet because that makes them a better leader on behalf of the people. We have two kings, Saul and David. Saul was deposed of his kingdom, and David, he earned the monarchy forever. Saul, I say to tell us, was pristine, was the tallest and most handsome and most refined and greatest sage, Mishich Vomamala, head and shoulders above everyone else. Yet his kingdom, that's the word I struggled to say, yet, yet his kingdom lasted but two years. David is someone that had lots of problems. Lots of problems. His own family thought he was unworthy to be king. 
his struggles are well documented. Yet he, specifically he, David, and not Saul, he is the one who's the king of the Jews forever. And we see this in many other areas, you know, even, even Moshe. Moshe has some checkered pedigree of his own. He's raised in Pharaoh's house. He married an outsider. He's not part of the establishment. And he was the humblest of men. Even his parents, it's a little bit of scandal because his father married his aunt and that would be prohibited by Torah law. But of course, it preceded Sinai, so it's okay. But it's it's really a scandalous relationship because had this union happened later, it would have been banned by Torah law and the children of that would have been bastards, mamzerim. You look at Messiah. Where does Messiah come from? It comes from a succession of scandals. Lot and his daughters, Judah and Tamar, Ruth and Boaz, David and Bathsheba. This is not a sterling or at least unimpeachable pedigree. And that's a plus. Leaders, transformative leaders, consummate leaders, leaders that can actually lead the flock, they have to have some flaw. Aaron was flawless, if you don't count the golden calf, says Moshe. For this you were chosen. This gave you a shortcoming that, again, counterintuitively, qualified you for this role. So that's the second idea. A general requirement of a leader is for them to have some flaw. And for this you were chosen, says Moshe to Aaron. This gave you a flaw that made you a better, a more qualified leader. And finally, the third explanation, this is, again, an adjacent idea, a similar idea. What does a Kohen need to do? What is the role of the Kohen? The primary role is to run the temple, to oversee all the operations of the temple, to oversee the sacrifices. Who comes to the temple? So, of course, there's a lot of reasons why someone would come to the temple or the tabernacle. But chief among that is a person who needs to bring a sacrifice and sacrifices are really all about repentance, someone who needs to fix something. Aaron thought that producing the golden calf disqualified him from being the high priest. But Moshe said to him, you have it backwards. The fact that you played a role in making the golden calf is exactly why you are the best candidate for the job. For this, you were chosen. The Kohen is someone who processes the sacrifice. Someone who has to bring a sacrifice is someone who faltered or blundered in some way or certainly wants expiation, wants purification, wants to be cleansed. And when someone needs to be cleansed, someone wants to rectify their ways, they need a helping hand. They need assistance. In the words of the Talmud, Ein hachavish matir as atzmo. Someone who's trapped, someone who is mired in a quagmire, they cannot release themselves. The standard Israelite cannot process their own sacrifice. He needs a Kohen to do it on his behalf. So the role of the Kohen is to help navigate the penitent through the repentance process and the sacrifice process. Who is best qualified for that job? What kind of person is the ideal candidate for this role? So Aaron said, well, I did the golden calf. I have way too much baggage. This is not for me. But the truth is, Aaron is someone, given his history, he is more qualified now to help navigate someone through a similar situation. If the Kohen is this pure angel, mistake-free, sin-free, pristine, someone like that is less helpful for someone. You don't know what I'm going through. You've never been in my shoes. How could you really help me? It's precisely because Aaron went through the process of sinning with the golden calf and, of course, the subsequent course correction and repentance, now he can be the Kohen to help others go through that same process. For this, you were chosen. 
your experience of blundering with the golden calf and rectifying your ways has given you a superpower to help navigate others through their challenges. So we have three similar ideas. And these three ideas are explaining why Aaron's experience with the golden calf actually, again, counterintuitively, qualified him to become the Kohen and to be the people's emissary. Idea number one is that he became a penitent. And therefore, the place where he stood is higher than he would have stood if he was completely righteous. And therefore, he is now qualified to become that great person. Idea number one. Idea number two, a general principle, all leaders have to have some skeletons in the closet. And finally, a Kohen in specifically, or a Kohen in particular, is someone who must aid the masses in their repentance process. And someone who has undergone such a process and can model that behavior for others can do it more effectively for this. You were chosen. But regardless of how precisely you formulate this idea, Aaron was selected only due to his involvement with the golden calf. Now, this is an idea that's a little bit of a volatile idea. It's a little bit dangerous. Because someone could say, well, Aaron improved, net, net, bottom line. He improved due to the golden calf. And therefore, we should try to find some golden calves to burnish our leadership credentials. That's the wrong takeaway. First of all, if you, if you sin willfully and you intend that eventually it will catapult you to greater heights, that doesn't work like that. It's going to backfire. I think the proper lesson is that we all have some trauma in our history. And those experiences bring with them, of course, a lot of pain and suffering and maybe, like Aaron, shame and some imposter syndrome. But they also carry with them opportunity. Your trauma is the key to your superpower. And idea number one is, well, if you become a penitent, you can become a Balchuva, and you have to know that you can achieve a height that even the completely righteous person cannot reach. The less than pristine origin, in a weird way, gives you a leg up. You can access greater heights. You can end up being closer to the Almighty as a result. If you put in the effort, it's not going to be easy. It's hard. But that opportunity only exists for those with imperfect pasts. The people who have a history are now more qualified for leadership. Again, the Talmud says it quite clearly. Yoma 22b. You have to have some skeletons in your closet. Those skeletons will make you a better leader, a more humble leader. Someone can relate to the masses better. And finally, if you have ever overcome any challenges in your life, you can serve as a role model for other people who are going through the struggles that you went through in the past. If you've undergone some sort of metamorphosis in your life, you've overcome something, trauma, depression, suffering, addiction, any difficult part of your life, and you've Managed to overcome it. Just you as a personality, you as a person, you represent hope for people going through that same challenge. And of course, this can apply in many different ways. You know, if you've beaten bankruptcy, if you've beaten cancer, God forbid, if you've gone through any trauma, if you've overcome any habit, if you were fortunate enough to discover Torah and God later on in your life, whatever change for the better that you've achieved in your life, if you've transformed yourself for the better, you know that you're now endowed with a superpower because you can help other people follow your path. And you may feel, like Aaron did, that, well, no, this is not for me. I'm so ashamed of what I've done in the past. Look at those horns. Those horns remind me of the horns of the golden calf. And Moshe said to me, you know, you have it wrong. 
This is why you were chosen. This is actually your superpower. And any one of us that has gone through such an experience, we can be confident that if Moshe was to assess our situation, he would tell us what he told Aaron, this is your superpower. For this you were chosen. Don't think that this makes you less qualified to lead and to help others. Quite the contrary. This is the only reason why you have the ability to change the lives of others and to change the world. Use your superpower. Improve the lives of others. Your trauma, your baggage, your history, that if you've been strong and committed and have achieved a modicum of success in navigating through that, you now have the ability to change the lives of others. Okay, left it to this week's exquisite insight. The second half of our Parsha deals with the laws of kosher and non-kosher animals. It goes through all the birds and the fish and the animals. And of course, we know the marks of a kosher animal, split hooves, and it re-chews its cud. Animals that have both of these signs are kosher. And the Torah, quite interestingly, delineates the animals that have one sign, but not the other. God tells Moshe, speak to the children of Israel, this is the animals that you should eat. If it's mafres, says parsa, if it has split hooves and it chews its cud, that is an animal that you can eat. And then he gives us a list of animals that have one sign, but not the other. But this is the animal that you should not eat, one that chews its cud, but does not have split hooves. And he gives three examples of that. The camel, the shafan, which is a bit of a debate what exactly that means, and the arneves, which is probably a bunny rabbit or a hare. These are three animals that chew their cud, but don't have split hooves, and therefore they have one sign, one marker of a kosher animal, but not the other. And therefore, they are not kosher. So three animals that indeed do chew their cud, but don't have split hooves, and they are not kosher as a result. And then it talks about the pig that has the opposite configuration. It has split hooves, and that's why it sticks its feet out to give off the impression of it being kosher, but it does not chew its cud. So we have four animals that have one, but not the other, and the Torah lists them. Now, there's a really interesting nuance. If you look at verse 4, 5, and 6, where it talks about the three separate animals that chew their cud, but don't have split hooves. So if you read it in the original Hebrew, you'll notice something really interesting. When it talks about the camel, the camel chews its cud, and it does not have split hooves. And that statement, it does not have split hooves, is written in the present tense. Verse 5, the shafan. It chooses God, ufarsa lo yafris. And it will not split its hooves. And in verse 5, the shafan, when it talks about its flaw, it presents it in the future tense. So, verse 4, the camel, present tense. Verse 5, The Shafan, future tense, verse 6, the Arneves, it chooses Tad, Ufarsa, Lohifrisa. And it did not, in the past, it did not have split hooves. So we're describing three animals with the same kosher, or I guess non-kosher profile. They chew their cud, but they lack the second sign of having the split hooves, and therefore, they are unkosher, they are impure. But it uses different tenses to describe their flaws. The camel is described in the present tense. It does not have, currently, split hooves. The shafan, in the future tense, it will not have split hooves. The nervous in the past, it did not have split hooves. Why does the Torah alter the description of of the lack of hooves on these three non-kosher animals. So I saw an amazing answer. This is attributed to a book called Kerem Shlomo. 
a beautiful idea. I love this idea. If you want to render something impure, if you want to assign on something the label, this is not kosher, this is illegitimate, you have to be completely certain that there's nothing redeeming about it. We're very quick to repudiate, to admonish, to castigate and berate others. Naturally, we're very judgmental. When we see flaws, it's so easy to condemn someone or something as being irredeemably evil. The Torah here is describing non-kosher animals. And it's showing us a certain degree of prerequisites needed to assign someone or something as being impure. You must know that it has no redeeming qualities, not just now, but in the past and in the future. And of course, which human can make that judgment? Only then can it be discarded as impure. We are quick to judge others. But that is not the Torah way. We read in the Mishnah, don't judge others until you arrive at their place. As it said today, don't judge others until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Don't condemn others until you are completely sure that they are no good. There is no thing that doesn't have its time and place. There is no man that doesn't have his, his hour. These are statements in the Mishnah to remind us that we must not be quick to judgment because we can judge something that does have, in fact, something redeeming about it. If you remember, all the way back in the beginning of Exodus, chapter 2, we read about Moshe and his youth and his birth and his coming of age. And he goes out and he sees his brethren and he watches in their suffering and torment. And he sees an Egyptian man striking a Hebrew man of his fellows. And in verse 12 of chapter 2 of Exodus, we read, Vayif and Kovacho, Moshe turned this way to and fro, and he saw there was no man. And he struck the Egyptian, and he buried him in the sand. Do you remember what Rashi says on that verse? He turned to and fro and saw there was no man. Rashi says something really surprising. Rashi says he, he looked to and fro, He looked into the soul of the man, the Egyptian man, and he saw there was no man who will in the future emerge from this Egyptian who will be righteous. This Egyptian man will have no descendants or doesn't even have the potential of having descendants who will convert, who will become righteous. And therefore he killed him. Moshe made a judgment here. His judgment was to assign guilt to this Egyptian man and to execute him. And the only way he did it, Aristides tell us, Rashi, based upon the Midrash, he was able to look prophetically into this person's future and he's able to determine that until the end of time, this person will have no righteous descendants. For all of eternity, there will be no righteous people destined to emerge from this man. And then he judged him. Of course, we are not endowed with that superpower. Maybe we have other superpowers, but not this one. And therefore, we learn a powerful idea not to judge others, not to be judgmental. The Chavetz Chaim of Blessed Memory used to say that when you judge others, you are actually casting a spotlight on yourself. Those who judge others will themselves be scrutinized by God. Are you so sure that you will be able to withstand the scrutiny? You're completely free of any wrongdoing? Likely not. And here we see another criterion for judging others. You have to be certain that they are totally impure, past, present, future, doesn't have split hooves, never had them, will never have them then you can say that they are totally impure. Do non-profit humans have the ability? We do not. And therefore, we ought not to judge others. And of course, it's a bad idea to boot, calling attention to the shortcomings of others, 
just brings the spotlight on you. It's a bad idea. We don't do it. It is inadvisable. Of course, the Torah can do it. Moshe, he can do it. If you are a member of a court, you are required to do it within a given protocol. But just, you know, us amongst our friends and other people, this is not the Torah way. I thank you for listening to this Parsha podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it. It was lovely. It was delightful. Thank you for listening. Have a fantastic rest of your day. And a splendid and wonderful, terrific rest of your week. And a sensational, delightful, peaceful, serene and tranquil Shabbos upcoming. And please, God, please, God, with help of the Almighty, we will once again reconvene next week for Parsha Tazria, for the Parsha Podcast, from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, Rabbi Yaakov Wolby, signing off, send me an email, rabbiwolby.com, and take care. Best regards. We'll talk next week.